All right, let's uh, get this memo up and running. Okay, so we have here, let me just select this. Okay, so we have here the revision of numbers. So the first question it says, find the highest common factor and the lowest common multiples of these three numbers. Now what we want to do is we want to find the prime factors of each of them. So let's start here with number one. So let's start with 30. So with 30, we can find its prime factors by using the ladder method. So the first prime number that can go into 30 is 2. And then 30 divided by 2 is 15. And we check, can 2 go into 15 again? No. So then we try the next prime number, 3. But can 3 go into 15? Yes. So 15 divided by 3 is 5. And then we check, can 3 go into 5 again? No. Next prime number, 5. Can 5 go into 5? Yes. 5 can go into 5, and once we get to 1 here, then we are done. So 30 can be rewritten as 2 times 3 times 5. Okay, and then we also do 45. So we do the same thing for 45. Check, can 2 go into 45? No. Next prime number is 3. Can 3 go into 45? Yes. So 45 divided by 3 is 15. 15, can 3 go into it? Yes. 15 divided by 3 is 5. And then we know 5 can again go into 5. So 45 we can rewrite as 3 times 3, which is 3 squared, times 5. Okay, and then we've got another number, 28. So we do the same thing for 28. First prime number is 2. Can 2 go into 28? Yes. 28 divided by 2 is 14. Can 2 go into 14? Yes. 14 divided by 2 is 7. Now, can 2 go into 7? No. Next prime number 3. Can 3 go into 7? No. Next prime number is 5. Can 5 go into 7? No. Next prime number is 7. Can 7 go into 7? Yes. So then 28 we can rewrite as 2 times 2, which is 2 squared, times 7. Okay, great. So that's the first part. Rewriting all of them in their prime factor form. Now, for the highest common factor, for the highest common factor, what we look for is we look for what is common. So let's start with 2. That's the first number we see, right? So is there a 2 in each of these things? So there's a 2 here. There's not a 2 here, so 2 is not common. Then we look at 3. There's a 3 here. Is there a 3 here? Yes. Is there a 3 in this one? No. So 3 is not common. 5. There's a 5 here. There's a 5 here. But there's no 5 here. So 5 is not common. So we have nothing that is a common factor. And if we have no common factors, then the highest common factor is just 1. Okay, so highest common factor is just 1. Then for the lowest common multiple, for the LCM, lowest common multiple, now, we don't. it doesn't have to be something that's common to both. So we first look at the 2. So then we look for the 2 with the biggest exponent. So this 2 has an exponent of 1. So if there's nothing written, there's a 1 as an exponent, right? So let me just put that in. It doesn't matter if you put it in or not. You know there's a 1 if there's nothing written. Okay, so we've got 2 to the power 1, and we've got a 2 to the power 2. So use the biggest one. So 2 to the power 2. Then 3, we also look for the biggest 3. So we've got 3 to the power 1. 3 squared, so we use the 3 squared, 3 to the power 2. Then, next is a 5, so we've got 5 to the power 1, 5 to the power 1, so 5 to the power 1 is the biggest 5, we use that. Then what else? We've already used the 3, we've already used the 5, we've already used the 2, but there's still a 7, so the biggest 7 is 7 to the power 1. And then we just multiply all of those together. So 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, so we've got 4 times 9, which is 36, times 5, which is 30 times 5 is 150, 6 times 5 is 30, 150 plus 30 is 180, and then 180 times 7. So 180 times 7, 100 times 7 is 700, 80 times 7 is 560, so 700 plus 560 is 1260. And that will be your lowest common multiple. Now, you could also go and write out all the factors and all the multiples of everything and see what is the highest common factor and lowest common multiple. Only thing here is it'll take you a very, very long time to get to this answer. So that's why prime factorization is the best option here.
Okay, that was question one. Then we get to question two. Question two, A. So we have to simplify, write the following as single fraction in its simplest form. So 90 over 54, let me write down the question. And then we just have to simplify this. So 90 over 54, what can go into both? So it doesn't matter if you choose the biggest answer first, or if you do a couple of steps. So then you could say 2 goes into both, and that gives you 45 over 27, and then go from there again. 3 can go into both of those, etc. But we can see 18 can go into both of these. So 90 divided by 18, and then 54 divided by 18, because 18 can go into both. 90 divided by 18 is 5, and 54 divided by 18 is 3. So that's our answer. 5 over 3. Again, if you use multiple steps, like let's say you first divided by 2, then you would have 45 over 27, and then you can divide by 3 of both of them, and get 5 over uh, 9, and divide by 3 again, then you get 5 over 3. So if you do it in many steps, that's also perfectly fine. No problem. As long as your final answer is in its simplest form. Alright, so that was question A. Now question B. 2B, we've got 4 over 5 minus, and we've got 3 over 4 divided by 9 over 2. Okay, so here, what do we have to do first? That's right, we have to do this part first because BOTMAS, right? Division comes before subtraction. So that'll give us 5 over 4 minus, and now we first have to do this part. So I'm going to put brackets around it. You don't have to, but I'm just going to do that to show. So we've got 3 over 4, and when we do division of fractions, we change the divide into a multiply, and then swap the second fraction around. So instead of 9 over 2, we'll have 2 over 9. All right. Next step is to evaluate that. So... Simplifying this, we can first simplify and then multiply, or we can first multiply and then simplify. I'm going to first simplify. So I'm going to say the 3 and the 9 can cancel to become 1 and 3. You're basically just dividing both by 3, just like we did in question A, simplifying the fractions. So you can simplify anything at the top with anything at the bottom. You can't simplify the 3 and the 2 or the 4 and the 9. That's not allowed, but anything at the top with anything at the bottom. And only once we have multiplied. So over here, you can't simplify the 3 and the 2, the 9 and the 4. Right? Okay, so that's that part simplified. And then I can also simplify the 2 and the 4. Both of them can be divided by 2. So 2 over 4 becomes 1 over 2 if we simplify. Here now we do the multiplication. So 1 times 1 is 1. And 2 times 3 is 6. So now we have 5 over 4 minus 1 over 6. Okay, in order to simply to do subtraction, we need to get a common denominator. So we can put both of these over 12. You can also do 24, that's fine. Well, any multiple doesn't have to be the lowest one, any multiple will work. Lowest one is good practice. Though. So uh, 5 over 4, we can change that into times both by 3, the bottom and the top. 4 times 3 is 12, 5 times 3 is 15. Minus then if we want to make this into a 12 as well, we have to multiply the bottom by 2. We also have to multiply the top by 2. So 1 times 2 is 2. Now that we have the same denominator, we can just rewrite the denominator and then subtract the tops. 15 minus 2 is 13. And that's our answer. Okay, great. Oh, sorry. What's happening here? Just get rid of that. All right. So that's our answer. Now again, let me just, in another color, let me just show what would we also could have done. Instead of first simplifying, we would have had 5 over 4 minus, and then the 3 over 4 times the 2 over 9. Okay? Then we would have had 5 over 4 minus, and then we could do the multiplication first if we like. 3 times 2 is 6. 4 times 9 is 36. And then after that, we could simplify that fraction. Not equals, minus. Again, 6 over 36, we simplify that. Both can be divided by 6, becomes 1 over 6. And now from there, it's the same as what we had from here. Okay, so now common denominator of 12. 
and this would be 15 over 12 minus 2 over 12, and that gives us 13 over 12. So that would work out the same way. All right, that was question two. Now we get to question three. Okay, so question three, we have percentages. So 3A, I, the first one of question three, 30% of 70. So now we have to calculate 30% of 70. So to do that calculation, 30%, percent, percent means over 100. So 30% of means times 70. Okay, and then we just do that calculation. So we can simplify first and then multiply, which I would suggest. So again, let's simplify. So we can simplify the 30 and the 100, both can divide divided by 10. So we can have that, 3 over 10. And then the 10 and the 70, both can be divided by 10 again. So we can do that. And now we have top times top, so 3 times 7 is 21 over 1 times 1 is 1, so that just gives us 21. So 21 is 30% of 70. Okay, second question in A, we have to find what is 135% uh, of 80. Okay, so 135% of 80. Okay, so again we do the same thing, 135% of 80. So again, I'm going to simplify first. So 180 can both be divided by 10. Um, and then 10 and 35, 10 and 135 can both be divided by 5. So if we divide this by 5, we get 2. If we divide that by 5, we get 27. And then we can just do our multiplication. Okay, so 27 times 8, well, let's actually do one more simplification. 2 and 8 can both be divided by 4. That gives us 1 and 2. Okay, so 27 times 2 is 54. 1 times 1 is 1, and that gives us 54. So 54 is 135% of 80. That's not right. I'm lying to you. This should be a 4. My bad. I apologize. Let me quickly go back. Go back to here. Sorry, 8 and 2 can both be divided by 2. So 2 divided by 2 is 1. 8 divided by 2 is 4. I'm sorry for that. Okay. Now, 27 times 4 is 108. Over 1 times 1 is 1. And that gives us 108. So 108 is 135% of 80. And just to make sure, let's just quickly check. 135% of 80. Oops, what's happening here? Equals 108. There we go. That's it. That works. All right. Then we get question B. Uh, what percentage is, okay, so 3B. Okay, so what percentage is 27 of 30? So what percentage is 27 of 30? Okay, so that actually means 27 out of 30. And to change that into a percentage, we're going to times by 100. All right, so again, let's simplify. So the 30 and the 100 can both be divided by 10. 27 and 3 can both be divided by 3. So 3 divided by 3 is 1. 27 divided by 3 is 9. Okay, and then we multiply. So 9 times 10 is 90 at the top. At the bottom, we've got 1 times 1, which is 1. So that just gives us 90. So 27 out of 30 is 90%. Good, and I suppose all of you know that by what you're getting for the test. If you get 27 out of 30 for a test, you get 90%. Right, the uh, second part of B. The okay, second part of B is what percentage is 45 out of 50? 45 of 50. So now we do 45 
out of 50, and we change that into a percent, so times by 100. Okay, so again, we can simplify. So 50 and 100 can both be divided by 50. So 50 divided by 50 is 1, 100 divided by 50 is 2. And then we multiply. 45 times 2 is 90, 1 times 1 is 1, so that gives us 90%. So if you get 45 out of 50, then you also get 90%. We'll just do this for the answers. All right, that was 3B. 3C, find the percentage change. You know, find the percentage change from 48 to 60. Okay, so 3C, you have to find the percentage change of from 48 to 60. Okay, so percentage change is the new value. So the new value minus the old value over the old value and then change that into a percentage, so times by 100. All right, so that gives us then 60 minus 48, which is 12, over 48, the old value, times by 100. And again, let's simplify. So 12 and 48 can both be divided by 12. 12 divided by 12 is 1. 48 divided by 12 is 4. And now 100 and 4 can also be simplified. Both can be divided by 4. So 4 divided by 4 is 1. 100 divided by 4 is 25. And then we do the multiplication. And again, you don't have to simplify fully before you do multiplication. You can simplify a little bit and then multiply. That's fine. As long as your final answer is fully simplified. Okay, so 1 times 25 is 25 at the top. At the bottom, we've got 1 times 1, which is 1. And 25 over 1 is just 25. So that's a 25%. Increase, right? It went bigger from 48 to 60 is bigger. So that's a 25% increase. Okay, so we ignore the positive or negative and just say if it's well, if it's positive, it's an increase. If it's negative, it'll be a decrease. Okay, so that was 3C the first one, then 3C the second one is what is the percentage change from 40 to 52? Okay, so from 40 to 52. So now we have to say again, it's the new value minus the old value divided by the old value times by 100 to change it into a percent. Okay, 52 minus 40 is 12 over 40 times 100. And again, let's simplify. So 40 and 100 both can be divided by 20. So 40 divided by 20 is 2, 100 divided by 20 is 5. Okay, and again, we can simplify the 2 and the 12, but in this case, uh, just to show you, it doesn't matter if we simplify fully. Let's first multiply and then simplify. Okay, so at the top, we'll have 12 times 5, which is 60. At the bottom, we've got 2 times 1, which is 2. And then 60 over 2 can simplify to 30 over 1, or just 30. So that's 30%. And again, it's positive, so it's a 30% increase. Okay, and we can also say it makes sense because it went from 40 to 52, so obviously it increased, it became bigger. Uh, then, uh, maybe I should, I'm not sure how far to the side I can write, make this still a proper PDF. I suppose it doesn't matter. Let me just go to the side because you guys will watch the video anyway, so it doesn't really matter if, it, if the document itself comes out a bit funny. So 3C, the third question. Uh, we have to say what is the percentage change from 60 to 48 okay so from 60 to 48 what is the percentage change so again we take the new value minus the old value divided by the old value and to change it into percentage times by 100 okay 48 minus 60 gives us negative 12 over 60 times 100 over 1. Okay, again, let's simplify. I'm just again, going to simplify just slightly. So the 60 and the 100 can both be divided by 10. And then let's maybe do the 12 and the 6. So both of them can be divided by 6. So we get 1 and we get 2. Okay, 
Now at the top, negative 2 times 10 is negative 20. And at the bottom, 1 times 1 is 1. So that gives us negative 20%. So negative 20 means that's a 20% decrease. And again, it makes sense if we look at the question. It went from 60 to 48, so it did decrease. So that's a 20% decrease. And important to notice, or at least interesting to notice, is that 60 to 48 gives us 20% decrease. 48 to 60 gives us 25% increase. So the per percent increase and decrease is not the same going from one number to the other and then back again. That's int interesting to note. So don't be fooled and think if you already got the question 48 to 60, that it's going to be the same answer, just, the, just negative, if you're going from 60 to 48. That's not the case. All right. So number four. Number four is about ratios. So 4a. Just make sure on the left hand side here. So 4a. We have divide. 72 into the following ratios, 2 to 3 to 4. So we have to divide 72 in the ratio 2 to 3 to 4. Okay, so how will we divide 72 into this ratio? So basically we have to check how many different parts is this, is this divided in. So we've got 2 plus 3 plus 4 parts. So 2 plus 3 is 5 plus 4 is 9. So 72 has to be split into 9 parts. And then this is two of that nine parts, this will be three of that nine parts, and this will be four of that nine parts, right? So two ways to think about it. The way that I prefer to think about it is we take 72 and we split it into those nine parts. This gives us the value of what each part is. All right, so 72 divided by 9 is 8. So each part is worth 8. So this gives us each part, and then we times it by 2, to get the value of these two parts. All right, 72 divided by 9 is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. Well, we can do the same for the 3. 72 divided by 9 is 8 times 3 is 24. And for this last part, the part of the 4, we do 72 divided by 9 times 4, because that's with 4 parts. And that's 8 times 4 is 32. And you can always do a sanity check by just adding these values together. Right? So if you add them, 16 plus 24 is 40. 40 plus 32 is 72. That matches. So yes, it seems like we did the right thing. Now, another, another thing we can also do, another way to think about it, instead of doing the 72 divided by 9 first, is we can say this 2 is 2 ninths, 2 out of the 9 parts. This is 3 out of the 9 parts. And that is 4 out of the 9 parts. And then we just multiply this fraction by the total. So we can say that's 2 ninths of 72. And then do that calculation. So, 70, so we can simplify first, or we can first multiply. Let's simplify. This can both be divided by 9. 9 divided by 9 is 1. 72 divided by 9 is 8. And then we get 2 times 8 is 16 over 1 times 1. So that's just 16. Then we can also do 3 ninths of 72. And again, let's simplify. So I'm going to simplify 3 and 9. They can both be divided by 3. And then we get 1 times 72 is 72. 3 times 1 is 3. And then 72 divided by 3 is 24. And the last one, we can say that's 4 ninths of 72. And again, let's simplify. So the 9 can be divided by 9. 72 can also be divided by 9. And then we get the top. 4 times 8 is 32. 1 times 1 is 1, so that's just 32. So we see we get the same answer. Whichever one of these makes the most sense to you is probably the best way to think about dividing something in a ratio. Okay, that was 4a. Then 4b... Or is that 4A1? Let me just check. So that's 4A1. Okay, 4A1. So let's do 4A2. 4A, the second part. So now we have to divide 72 in the ratio 5 to 7. So we have to divide 72 in the ratio of 5 to 7. Okay, so we'll do the same thing. I'm just going to do this one a little bit quicker since we've already had a look at it. 
Okay, so again, 5 plus 7, that's 12 parts. So we can either say 72 divided by 12 times 5 for this first part. 72 divided by 12 is 6. 6 times 5 is 30. And then for the other part, 72 divided by the 12 total parts times 7 for these 7 parts. And again, you can put it as a fraction if that makes your life a bit easier. So 72 divided by 12 is 6. 6 times 7 is 42. Or... Again, we could say, this is 5 twelfths of 72. And again, we can simplify. So 72 and 12 can both be divided by 12, which gives us there 1 and there's 6. And then 5 times 6 is 30. 1 times 1 is 1, so that's 30. And the other one is 7 twelfths of 72. And again, let's simplify. 12 can be divided by 12, 72 can also be divided by 12. Now we multiply at the top, 7 times 6 is 42, and at the bottom 1 times 1 is 1, so that's just 42. Okay, I hope you get the idea there. Next up we have 4b. So it says it takes 3 cups of water and 5 cups of flour to bake one cake. Okay, so that's 4b. Okay, so we have water we've got flour, and we've got number of cakes. Okay, so I would suggest writing yourself or uh, noting down a little table or a little ratio picture like this, if you're working with something like this. And just write down the information you have to start with. Okay, so it takes three cups of water, five cups of flour. Three cups of water. Where's my pen now? Okay, there it is. So three cups of water. Five cups of flour to bake one cake. All right. Now, how many cups of water would you need to bake four cakes? Okay, so we're just working with water and cakes now for the first question. Okay, so we've got water to cakes. So that's three to one. So we need to build bake four cakes. How many cups of water do we need? So again, this is the unknown value. I'm just going to call it x for the unknown value. Okay, then what we can do is we can cross multiply. There's many ways we can do this. Uh, let's first look at some of the easy, some of the ways that are easier to see when it's nice numbers like this. So here we can see one. How do we get from one to four? What do we need to times by? We need to times by four, right? So that means we also need to times this by four. And then 3 times 4 is 12. And 12 is our answer. That works. Okay. But if it's not nice numbers where it's not as easy to see what to times by, then I would suggest the following. The cross multiplication method, because that will work in any circumstance. But again, whatever works for you for now is the best way to do it. So cross multiply. You can imagine that. It's a cross. So multiply those two. 1 times x is x. Then you put equals. And then you multiply the other two things across. So 4 times 3. 4 times 3 is 12. Okay, then you get x by itself. In this case, x is already by itself. So that's our answer. All right. Now for the second part of the question. How many cups of flour would you need to use if you use 36 cups of water? Okay, so now we've got water and flour for the second one. So here we've got water and flour. So that ratio we were given is 3 to 5. And they ask if we use 36 cups of water. So now the question states we've got 36 cups of water. What will be the amount of flour, the cups of flour? So again, let's call that x. Let's do cross multiplication again. So cross multiply those two. 3 times x is 3x. And then multiply those two. 5 times 36. So 5 times 30 is 150. 5 times 6 is 30, add those and we get 180. And then again, divide both sides by 3 to get x by itself, right? So divide by 3, divide by 3, those cancel out. We have x equals 180 divided by 3 is 60. And that's our answer. Now again, in this case we could have also seen 3 times what gives you 36? That's times 12, because it's a nice easy number to see. That means we also have to do 5 times 12. And 5 times 12 is 60. So we can see that works out. All right. 
That was question 4B. Then we still have 4C. Okay. So 4C I'm just going to do right here. So time spent training is directly proportional to the number of victories V. Complete the table below. So directly proportional means as one gets bigger, the other one also gets bigger. So here, we can also do the cross multiplication thing. But in a table form, it's usually uh, nice numbers that are given. So 4 times what gives us gets us to 8? So it's going to be 4 times 2 to get us to 8, right? Then it's also 10 times 2. So 10 times 2 is 20. And now here, from 10 to 5, what do we multiply or divide by? We can also go from 20 to 5, it doesn't matter. But let's stick with the original values in case we made a mistake in our answer. So 10 divided by what gives us 5? 10 divided by 2. So then also 4 divided by 2. So 4 divided by 2 is 2. Now for this one, so 4 times what gives us 24? 4 times 6 gives us 24. So then also 10 times 6, which is 60. So you see what happens. Whatever you multiply or divide by at the top, you do the same thing at the bottom. That's for directly proportional. Right? If one is multiplied, the other one is also multiplied. If one is divided, the other one is also divided. That is directly proportional. Now, question 4D, the number of people P is indirectly proportional to the time taken T. Complete them. So indirectly, if directly was multiply, multiply, or divide, divide, Indirectly is just the opposite. If one is multiply, the other one is divide. If one is divide, the other one is multiply. And that's basically what it comes down to. Okay, so let's start with the easier ones first. So let's say from 6 to 3, that's divided by 2, right? So 6 divided by 2 is 3. Then we have to go 12 times 2 because it's inverse. So this is divided by 2, so times 2. And then we get 24. Okay, now for this 36, 12 times 3 is 36. So we times 3 at the top, which means we divide 3 at the bottom. So 6 divided by 3 is 2. Okay, and now we need to get to the 9. So probably you can see 12 times something, what gives you 9 a bit more difficult. It's not a whole number. But we can see 36 divided by 4 will give us 9. So 36 divided by 4 at the top, which means 2 times 4 at the bottom. 2 times 4 is 8. So that's the one way. But there's an even nicer way, which we can do indirect proportion. We can see if we get given a table. Indirect proportion, the product of each column will be the same. So 12 times 6, 72. Right? Then, we're, this product has to be the same. So 9 times what will give you 72? 9 times 8. 72. 3 times 1 is 72. 3 times 24 is 72. And 36 times 2 is 72. So you can also just find the product of 1 and the other products must all be the same if it is indirectly proportional. With direct, that doesn't work. We can see here 4 times 10 is 40. 8 times 20 is 160. So that's not nearly the same thing. Right? But in indirectly proportional, those are the two methods you can do. Either find what you times or divide by and just do the opposite operation at the bottom of what you did at the top, or just find what is the constant that every column would have to as the product to, as the times to, and then use that to find the missing values. Either of those methods are fine. All right, now we get to question five. Evaluate the following. So four minus negative three minus seven. Okay, question five. Let me just go down here. Question 5a. So that's 4 minus negative 3 minus 7. Okay, so again, bod mass. So we have 4 minus, we first have to evaluate the bracket. So inside the bracket, we've got negative 3 minus 7. So negative 3 minus 7 is negative 10. And if you're unsure where the negative 10 comes from, think about a number line. We start at negative 3, and we have to go minus 7, so 7 to the left. So 1, 2, 3, etc. So that's negative 4, negative 5 on the number. And we have to go 7 to the left until we get to negative 10. So think of a number line if you're a little bit unsure about, about how we get with the minus and plus signs. This is going to be very important in the future, so make sure you understand the negative and positive sign things. Okay, now we have 4 minus negative 10. So minus minus makes a plus. 
So that means we've got 4 plus 10. And that gives us 4 plus 10 is 14. And that's our answer. Okay, 5b. 5b. So negative 2 cubed plus, I'm just going to sometimes write this all down. So negative 2, oops, uh, negative 2 cubed plus, uh, brackets 32 divided by negative 2. Brackets 32 divided by negative 2. Okay. So again, negative 2 cubed plus, we have to sort the brackets out first. So 32 divided by negative 2. So it's a positive divided by a negative, which means it's negative. And then 32 divided by 2 is 16. Okay. Now, we've got negative 2 cubed. So the bot mass, the O, the exponents or the powers are part of the O part. So we have to do that next. So negative, and the threes, the cube is only with a two, right? This is different than this. Although in this case the answer would be the same, but it's only the two that is cubed. So we've got negative, and then two cubed means two times two times two. So two times two is four, times two is eight. And then plus minus makes minus. So negative eight minus sixteen. And again, negative 8, and we go 16 to the left of that, that gives us negative 24. Okay, and then 5c. Okay, so we've got 20 minus, big square root sign. So 20 minus, big square root sign. And in there we have 3 squared plus negative 4 squared. 3 squared plus negative 4 squared. Okay, so 20 minus. Now in this, so 3 squared is 9, plus, and then negative 4 squared. So now the square is for the whole negative 4. So square means times by itself. Negative 4 times negative 4 is positive 16. Positive 16. Okay, so that gives us 20 minus the square root, and then 9 plus 16 is 25. So 20 minus, and the square root of 25 is 5. So that gives us 20 minus 5, which is 15. Okay, so it's just the order of operations. This should become second nature after a while. If you're still struggling a little bit with this, doing the right things first, no problem. Just a bit of practice to get used to it. You'll get very, very used to this pretty quickly. Next up, question six. Oh, that's the last question. Okay, state whether each of the following numbers are natural numbers, whole numbers, integers, rational numbers, irrational numbers, real numbers, non-real numbers, or undefined. Okay, so for this, I might as well just do it on here. Okay, so the square root of 27. Okay, square root of 27 is not a whole number. So if we have a square root and the answer is not an integer, if the answer is not an integer, then it's irrational. So irrational, or well, maybe I should, let me just try down all the different, um, I'm actually, I'm gonna do it all here because I might have to show some calculations. So six, first of all, we've got our natural numbers. So we need to know these symbols, right? So that is natural numbers natural numbers then we've got the whole numbers which is just natural numbers plus zero so that's just an n zero those are the whole numbers and then we've got integers which is a z so those are the integers those are positive and negative whole numbers then we've got the rational numbers which we write with a q those are the rational numbers so that is anything that you can write as a fraction or any decimal that stops. It's not a recurring disk. Any decimal that stops or has a pattern that continues forever. Irrational numbers are numbers that you cannot write as a fraction, which means they have they cannot be written as a fraction, or they've got decimals that continue forever but has no pattern. Then we've got the real numbers. So the real numbers are all of these. Anything that falls into any of these previous categories is a real number. 
So those are real numbers. Then we've got non-real. So we've got things outside of the real, but for, for us, we're just working with up to real numbers. So non-real is anything that falls outside of the real numbers, but has a specific value. So the non-real numbers are specifically any number that's the even root of a negative number. For instance, or example, is the square root, or let's say the sixth root of negative eight. That's non-real, because it's an even root of a negative number. So that is non-real. Then we also have undefined, undefined numbers. So that is anything, anything divided by zero. For example, three divided by zero, right? Three divided by zero, undefined. Both of these things will give you the same error on your calculator, but they are not the same. They are different. This actually has a value, although it's not a real value. This does not have a value. It's undefined. Okay. So now that we've quickly gone through the number system, let's. I'm just going to write down all the numbers quickly. Square root 27, cube root negative 27, okay, square root 27, cube root of negative 27, uh, square root of negative 27, square root of negative 27, uh, 2 over 3, z 2 over 3, 0, 7 over 0, 2 over 3, 0, 7 over 0, uh, 2.347 recurring, so 2.347 recurring, so that means, what that little line means, that means 2.347, 347, 347, etc. forever. Right? That's what that means. Then 5.1235. Okay. So 5.1235. What's the rest of that number? 27769. Okay. Two seven seven six nine and then five point one two three five two seven seven six nine dot dot dot. Okay, so let me just erase this because the question looked a bit different. The question just had that with a line on top, like this. Okay, all right, now to answer. So, square root of 27. So if you type that on the calculator, you get 5 point something, right? Because we've got, it's between the square root of 25 and the square root of 36. So it's between 5 and 6. Now, we said, if there is no integer answer, no whole number, positive or negative whole number answer to a root, that means it's irrational. So irrational. And if anything is irrational, then it's also real. Right? Anything that's irrational is also real. Let me, maybe I should quickly draw that box diagram again. Uh, wait, let's do, no, where's, can I insert shapes or something? Mm, no, okay, let's just draw it. Okay, so we have the natural numbers. Then we have, outside of that, we've got the whole numbers. So we see all natural numbers also whole numbers. Then outside of that, we've got the integers. So all of the whole numbers are also integers. Then we've got the rational numbers. So all the integers are also rational numbers. Then we've got the irrational numbers. Right, so irrational numbers are not rational numbers. They're in a different set. And then all of these together form the real numbers. Okay. So anything that's, let's say in here, 
So this box is also in this box, also in this box, also in that box. So that's going to be important. So if we have a look at this first one, squared, so that's irrational, which means it's also real, right? So it was in this box, and this box is also in that box. So irrational and real, but it's not inside the others. Okay, next up, cube root of negative 27. So cube root of negative 27 equals negative 3. And where does negative 3 go? Negative 3 is an integer, right? So it's integers, rational numbers, and real numbers, okay? So you see it's integers, and integers are also in this, and this is also in that. Okay, next up, square root of negative 27. That's over here, right? It's the even root of a negative number. So that is non-real. Non-real. So it doesn't go anywhere here. It's outside of the reals. 2 over 3, that is rational. We can't, so this is the simplified form. So it's a rational number, right? So it's not an integer, but it is rational. And rational is also real. So rational is also real. Rational and real. Zero. So zero is not a natural number, but it is a whole number. Whole numbers are also integers. Integer is also rational. Rational is also real. So all four of those. So it's a natural number, which means it's also an integer, which means it's also a rational number, which means it's also a real number. Seven over zero. That's over here, right? That's anything divided by zero is undefined. Undefined. Okay, 2.347. So this line means it's recurring. We can also write it as this, 2.347. We can also write it with dots like this. That also means 347, 347, 347 forever. Okay, so it's a decimal that goes on forever, but it has a pattern. We know what the pattern is. That means it's a rational number. And rational numbers are also real numbers. Okay, next up. We've got a very long decimal here, but it does stop. So it means we can write it as a fraction because we can just say it's 512352776 over 1 with lots of zeros. That's going to give us this, right? So we can write it as a fraction. If it stops somewhere, it is rational. And rational numbers are also real numbers. Then over here, we've got a long decimal with dot or dot. So it continues forever and there's no pattern. We don't know what comes next. So if there's no pattern and it continues forever, then it's irrational. And irrational numbers are also real numbers. Okay, I think that was it. Okay, so that's a recap on everything to do with numbers. Topic 1 slash topic 5 on Gen X. Okay, I hope that was helpful. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask.